This video is made possible by Practical Defense Systems, the best online security training at the lowest prices. You can start your security career today online at pdsclasses.com. Check them out. Hi, I'm Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for all of your support of Gun Guy TV. I'm very, very grateful. Yes, I'm in a different location today. I'm actually sitting in our classroom in Mission Valley. I've got a lot of work to do today, so I figured I'd do the interview from here. I've got an interview with Ben Sanderson from Gun Owners of America. We're going to talk about the executive order that President Biden just signed. I even have trouble calling him President Biden, but I guess he is. But anyway, he just signed it, uh, trying to go around to Congress to keep you from exercising your God-given, natural, Second Amendment guaranteed right to keep and bear arms, and GOA is all over it. And we'll give you the details on that executive order and what GOA is going to do to fight it and what you can do as well. We'll do that in just a second. In the meantime, I would urge you to check out these alternative locations because YouTube can be rather sketchy. And frankly, I'm of the opinion Rumble is a better platform. So maybe go over to Rumble or BitChute or one of those and subscribe just in case a video here goes away because sometimes they do. And then you might also check out the Gun Guy TV Firearms Podcast. You can listen to that on any of your favorite podcast players. If you want to see the video version, you can do that also on Rumble, and there is a link in the description. All right. Uh, lastly, if you want to support the channel, obviously, this is not what I do for a living. Uh, I'm not a, a, a guy on YouTube trying to make a living doing it. I'd be very broke. This is what I do for a living. Uh, I actually own a training company, and so uh, that's what I do. But in order to support the channel and the effort I do here to fight for the Second Amendment, if you'd like to do that, you can most easily do that by either checking out the company that I own, Practical Defense Systems, come do some training with us. The link is in the description. Or if you want, you can sign up on Gun Guy TV Crew. It's a place where you can find a lot of exclusive content you can't find anyplace else. And that way you can help support Gun Guy TV and all the effort that uh, that I put into this. All right, let's go talk to Ben. Ben, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate it. I realize it's on kind of short notice, and you guys are busier in a one-legged man at a butt-kicking contest. But since uh, bumbling Biden is bumbling again, and he's out there signing things because he can't get stuff through Congress, I read it, and I probably have one-eighth the understanding of it that you do. So what exactly does this executive order that he signed the other day do, and what should we be concerned about, and what is GOA concerned about? Uh, so first off, Joel, it's great to be back on the show. The, the biggest thing about this is it's President Biden wanting to go forward with gun control without consent of Congress and the American people. Uh, the, even in his press release, he said that this was to get us as close to a universal background check system as possible without any further legislation from Congress. And now this is insane. Uh, but we've talked about this in the past. Like last year, this is a lot of these bills are coming out of the Corner Murphy Compromise in which uh, 12 senator, Republican senators came over and went across the aisle and decided to give up on gun rights. On top of that, it's also from the omnibus spending. We have a lot of different little programs in there. Uh, but we can start with universal background checks. The thing is, this is solely to help build President Biden's illegal gun registry. Uh, we're looking at all of the numbers right now, and I've got I've got our information on it right now, and it's insane. You know what it really wants to do is, like I said, add these 4473s and add every single time a gun tra transfers between hands to that illegal registry, so the ATF can come back, look for it, and have all this information. And as we know, the first thing right after or right after registration comes confiscation, and especially with all these new rules coming out, the framework receiver rule, the Biden pistol brace rule. It's really scary because we've seen the ATF go after law abiding citizens simply because they have the ability to. We've seen them go after solvent traps. We've seen them go after people who have multiple gun purchases claiming that they're straw purchasing. Uh, so that's really scary. On top of that, we also have the zero tolerance policy, which is shutting down FFLs to get their out of business to get their 4473s to get their records and send them into the registries that we now know it and that's okay would you explain bill. that because i'm yeah. i'm not sure i understand how that works how does that work uh, on the zero tolerance or on the registry 
on the zero tolerance. Well, I, obviously, the zero tolerance is driven for the purpose of getting the records, but I, I, you just described a process I'm not sure the average person understands and what happens with those records at an FFL because I don't understand it, and I, I consider myself an average person. So would you kind of give us a little bit of a view as to what happens there with an FFL and their records? Of course, yeah. Uh, so the ATSA Legal Registry is built out of the Out of Business Record Center currently, and that's nearly a billion records the last time we've gotten information on it. I'm sure at this point it's well above that number. Uh, but essentially, an FF, if, sorry, excuse me, if an FFL goes out of business or is shut down for whatever reason, uh, which I'll touch on in a second, they have to then give all of their records for the last 20 years to the ATF. And so it's going to go into that billion record registry I'm talking about. So zero tolerance, what they've been doing is they've been going after FFLs for innocent mistakes, such as a paperwork, mis paperwork mistake or forgetting to transcribe something. And this is a single time. They have, they have called these paperwork mistakes uh, an automatic revocation under zero tolerance. So what that means is uh, you could have been perfectly fine for 20 years. You could have been perfectly in compliance. But if you make uh, you know, a zero instead of an O on the serial number or something like that, you are the ATF would come in and say, hey, because you've done it right for 20 years and you've been in compliance for 20 years, this one mistake shows that you willfully did this. And this is a willful violation of the law, and therefore we can shut you down. And it's insane. And if you've noticed uh, anecdotally, I can say that there have been a, quite a few FFLs around me that have been shut down. And this is the most FFLs revocations we've seen shut down in forever. And this well, is so because are they shutting them FFLs. down for the purpose of a shutting them down so there's fewer of them, and b getting the records so that they can because you you called it an illegal registry, and it, that's exactly right because it's it's illegal for the federal government to maintain a registry of firearms. That's my understanding. So are they just trying to get the records to add them to this, and then also so limit the number of gun stores? You know, I say it would be both. It serves both purposes. Like, you, like I said earlier, yeah, it gives all these records into the Out of Business Record Center. But at the same time, it limits your ability as an American citizen to be able to practice your Second Amendment rights. And, you know, it's harder for me. I, I have my local one got shut down. And, you know, that was about a 30 minute drive for me. So now I have to go an hour or maybe even two hours to find one that hasn't been shut down. I'm a little selfish in saying that, oh, my FFL got shut down. I have to go somewhere else. But for the people that work there, their entire livelihood is gone. They've got to find something else. This isn't publicly out there. We actually got this in a leak. We had to uncover this secret new policy that they're going through. And when we've, re we've released everything on our website, so now the FFLs will know, uh, but we had been getting calls about, hey, I, got, I don't know why all the FFLs in my area are going down. So it wasn't until we got this information that we were in, we provided to the public that people actually knew what was going on. And the thing is, there's not a sudden uptick in rogue FFLs. These people aren't there's not like, you know, a 100% increase in people selling to the cartels or selling to criminals or anything like that. So this isn't about public safety. This is simply to limit your right to the Second Amendment and also to get these FFLs out of business. Okay, so they're trying to... Good night, nurse. I'm so grateful for you guys. <laughs> Thank you for fighting this battle. What other horrors have we discovered in this executive order? Well, going back to the executive order, uh, a lot of this came from the omnibus in which a lot of people looked at it as like, oh, it's not a gun battle. It's not something that we're going to willing to stick our neck out there and actually fight for gun owners' rights. Uh, so we have red flag laws, uh, which are obviously poison. Uh, but people have said, oh, it has due process. But they didn't mention where the due process was. So that means the police could come to your house, take your guns first, and then, you know, you get a day in court. But that's already there, there's an issue with that, that it's out of order. They're going to come to your house and take your guns without any due process first and then say, oh, we're going to give you due process on the back end. That doesn't make sense. Well, it's a violation uh, of the Fourth Amendment. Exactly. It's, it's a Fourth <laughs> Amendment violation. You can't seize property without due process. You have to have the due process first. But as I'm reading through this, I, I mean, he hit a bunch of different stuff. He's got red flag laws he wants to push in there. He's got, um, as you said, I think I agree with you, this is a registry one individual at the range asked me, I was teaching yesterday, and he asked me, hey, is, does this mean that if I'm in a free state, because that guy was you know, from, a, from Arizona, he said, you mean I can't do private sales anymore? I said, I don't know. Uh, but to answer that question, uh, Biden is basing his legal impetus on the changing of what engaged in business means. And we've seen this in the past. President Obama, on his, one of his last days, signed an executive order to clarify what he thought was a gun dealer. So that means one single person selling a gun or more than once 
you know, could be charged as illegally selling that firearm, not going through an FFL. Uh, you know, that's up to five years in prison and it's a $250,000 fine. So really, uh, it does come from the Corn and Murphy uh, piece of legislation. It comes from section 12001, in which they changed what the definition of engaged in business means. And, and so that's are we really talking scary. about, there's a section I in this thing, and it says, and I think I know what you're talking about, but just for clarification, uh, section I says, clarify the definition of who is engaged in the business of dealing in firearms and thus required to become federal firearms licensees in order to license in order to increase compliance with the federal background check requirement for firearm sales, including by considering a rulemaking. In other words, he's asking them to change the rules as appropriate and consistent with applicable law. I'm not so sure that he cares about whether it's appropriate or consistent with applicable law, but is that basically what we're talking about? Yep, that's exactly what we're talking about. So in other words, if I'm a private citizen and I make more than X number of sales in a given year because I'm just selling off my collection of guns, He's gonna. He may want me to then be a licensed dealer so that he can have a background check on each one of those guns, even though they're private sales. Is that what you're alluding to? Uh, they want you to go through an FFL, uh, and you know, there's a lot of issues with this universal background check system. Say the government decides to shut down gun stores again, which we'd have to sue over. We have in the past, especially during the COVID pandemic, when people were trying to say that gun stores and the Second Amendment wasn't essential. Uh, you know, and then also. It, other issues, if you live in a rural area where you just want to sell a gun to your friend, you still have to drive, you know, maybe an hour to the first FFL you can find. Uh, but what if they're closed? What if the NIC system goes down? That's a lot of wasted man hours. It's a lot of wasted time. And it really is doing nothing to stop crime. This is simply stopping law abiding citizens from being able to transfer and, um, and sorry, excuse me, and practice their Second Amendment rights. Am I reading this wrong? I mean, he's involving all these huge agencies, including the Department of Defense in this. I'm not sure where that comes from. Uh, so I can touch on that a little bit, but the voluntary safe storage program that was in last year's omnibus, which was supposed to be only for the military, and then they said would be a suicide prevention. Well, actually the DOG just released an independent report uh, finding out how they can stop suicide on their bases. And of all of the anti of all of the recommendations almost all of them were anti-gun you know they want to stop you from being able to buy a f firearm until you're 25 they want to give you a week waiting period for a firearm and four days if you're buying ammunition which is insane i mean our veterans and our service members deserve just as many rights as normal law-abiding citizens do right i mean but the other thing <laughs> that's interesting is there's a there's an item e in here and i don't remember what which section it was in. But item E says, the Secretary of Defense in consultation with the Attorney General and the Secretary of Homeland Security shall develop and implement principles to further firearm and public safety practices through the Department of Defense's acquisition of firearms consistent with applicable laws. So I'm not sure, the only thing I could see in that, and it's, this is as a businessman, I mean, I'm sitting in my classroom here from our business, is if I'm the Department of Defense and I want to push a manufacturer into restricting the firearms it sells to citizens, maybe I can do that by the fact that I'm a huge buyer and if you want this contract, you have to bend to my will. But that's all I, and that's sort of, you know, evil. <laughs> maybe yeah. I'm a conspiracy theorist, I don't know. But I'm reading that going, how, how, how else? Does the Department of Defense, th through the Department of Defense's acquisition of firearms, affect public safety and uh, and firearms safety? I, I'm I'm lost by that one. I don't know if you guys picked up on that or not, but it it, it struck me. Yeah, that uh, provision is so vague that it could mean a lot of things. And just like you said, it could be that they want to make exclusive contracts with firearm manufacturers. Uh, and, you know, hopefully I, I think that the industry won't do that simply because they recognize how important giving fire or selling firearms and arming the citizenry is. There might other there might also be different organizations that don't agree with that. Uh, but there's a yeah, that, that's so vague that could mean a lot of different things. Sure. <laughs> this I thought was interesting. And this was an advertising provision, item H. The Federal Trade Commission is encouraged to issue a public report analyzing how gun manufacturers market firearms to minors and how such manufacturers market firearms to civilians, 
including through the use of military imagery. Well, as far as I know, manufacturers don't market to minors since minors cannot purchase firearms. So I'm not sure where they're going with that. Uh, it's an anti-gun talking point. They want to say that these gun ads are meant to be seen by children. They're meant to be, uh, you know, brainwashing them. But the truth is they want to discourage the positive perception of firearms. That is 100% an anti-gun talking point. That firearms are nothing more than a tool, but they're, they're definitely something that can be used to protect yourself, and they should be looked at as positive. I carry a firearm on, uh, firearm on me every single day because I realize that I am responsible for my own safety. There's nothing negative about that, and there shouldn't be anything negative about that. that people should be able to respond and uh, res sorry, respond and for their own safety within themselves whenever they want. That's exactly 100% an American right. Uh, but going on to that, we also have, uh, they want the Department of Transportation is suggested to start putting pressure on F FedEx, UPS, all of these mail uh, providers to start tracking firearm purchases through the mail. We've seen that in the past, how they wanted to change around and require different storage rules and shipping rules for firearms and ammunition. Uh, so this is definitely an extension of that. What do we do to fight this thing other than uh, talk about it, which is what we're doing and making sure the public knows? Uh, well, there's definitely a lot of different things we can do. There's a lot of different options we're looking at right now. But one of the most important things would be to call your representatives and your senators and demand that they, they introduce legislation to fight against this. Uh, we already have legislation to fight against the registry and therefore somewhat universal background checks. That's the no registry rights by Representative Michael Cloud. I'm trying to figure out how that helps in an environment where any legislation that's going to actually do anything is going to have to pass both houses of Congress. There's a very good chance it would pass the House, Senate, not so much. And even if it passes both of those places, uh, Biden's got to sign it and he's not going to sign it. So what does that do if we have legislation working its way through Congress that we know for a fact the sitting president, who is the enemy of the Second Amendment and pretty much the Constitution as a whole, is not going to sign it when it hits his desk. So the first thing is, it's never a bad time for a good pro-gun bill. Uh, yes, right now, currently, the Senate is not friendly towards guns and the House is. However, the more and more good legislation we can get out, the more and more no compromise, you know, going against the NFA, going against the GCA, all of that kind of legislation. A few years ago, it wasn't popular, but now people are understanding these issues. They're understanding how much of a danger they are to their constituents. So getting their name down is super important because it shows in the future that they've agreed with this. It's like, hey, I've already said this in the past. I don't want to change my stance on it. I am pro Second Amendment. I'm going to sign it for when we have the votes and when we have the ability to get these laws passed in. It's a so little you're, bit. You're slow. using it as a tool to identify who in the Senate and who in the House is with us and who is not. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Yes, but it's also changing the ideas and the co the culture around the Second Amendment. It's saying that, hey, short barrel rifles are something that every American should own. So we're going to pass legislation. I'm going to sign on to legislation that might not pass this session. But once we have the votes and once we have the White House, it will pass because enough people have voted and signed on, put their name behind the idea that American citizens should be, own, be able to own any kind of barrel length they want. <laughs> Okay, so the, and the reason I asked the question is because, I, and I have to admit I felt this way too, is that a lot of folks contact me and say, why should I contact my congressman or my senator? The president's not going to sign it anyway. It's a waste of time. And so you're telling me it's not a waste of time because it helps pre kind of prime the pump for when it's time. And at the same time, it helps GOA identify who's on whose side and forces them to vote. Is that what you're talking about? On top of that, it can be used as an example of why in certain bills that have to pass every single year, like appropriate, the appropriations bills or the National Defense Authorization Act, it gives examples why where we should defund. You know, we want to defund the ATF. This is if the president doesn't sign uh, the Congressional Review Act or a dif different piece of legislation that would make it pro-gun, you can defund the ATF so that they can't actually enforce any of this. And, you know, it's a stopgap because the laws still exist. But if we defund their ability to actually enforce these laws, then we can then move forward and, and push our preferred legislation. So the Congress has the power to pull certain levers then, and one of which is the purse strings. So even though 
you got a bill that provides a lot of money or tells the ATF, for example, to do X, Y, or Z, the House of Representatives, for example, can say, well, you know all that money that you were promised? We're not sending it to you. We just voted not to do that, so you can't do X, Y, and Z. And if you'd like to do anything, you might want to negotiate with us. Is that what you're – I'm, I'm trying to understand the process here and where Congress can actually help in an environment like we're, that we're in uh, with a president that doesn't want to help us at all. Uh, so you're 100% correct on the budget stuff. Uh, but also I would say that the more and more pressure that gets built up, the more and more that you talk to your uh, your representatives and your and your senators, the more and more that ideas are going to shift. Uh, you know, there are some moderate Dems uh, like Senator Manchin that have said he's against an assault weapon ban. So if we give him calls and we talk about how the pistol brace ban is actually an assault weapons ban, then we can push him towards our side and push him to be more pro Second Amendment. Uh, so it's really in those middle grounds as well. We have strong members, uh, you know, on our side like championing in our cause. Uh, but at the same time, there's those people in the middle that we can definitely change their minds. Maybe not on everything, but on individual topics. How can the individual gun owner help? What can we do? Uh, you know, it really does come down to contacting the representative. Even if they are anti-gun, they still notice and they will still see that, hey, these people in my district, these people in my area, don't want me to do this. And you know, they do a, they do a pro and they do it against, they tally mark the calls they get. And it's about being, you have to be respectful. You have to make your voice heard. But at the same time, they do count how many people are against it or are for it. Uh, so that is really important in changing their minds down the road. Uh, on top of that, it's, it's talking to people about the second amendment. It really isn't just something that we can do all on our own. Uh, we need to bring in as many people as we can. And because the more normalized it gets, the more people that join, the harder it is to ignore and the harder it is to pigeonhole gun owners into this one box. Ben, thank you very much for your time. I really do appreciate it. And uh, please say hi to Eric for me. Have a wonderful week and stay safe, okay? Thanks to all you too. Take care. <laughs> all right, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for watching the entire interview. I really do appreciate it. Uh, we'll have GOA on again to talk about some other things soon. And as soon as it warrants, I'm also working to see if I can get either Rick Travis from California Rifle and Pistol Association or Sam Paredes to come on and talk to us about what's going on in California the next week or so. Obviously, they're extremely busy. There's a lot going on in California. And so getting their time is, is not easy, but I will do my best. In the meantime, uh, check out Gun Guy TV crew, as I mentioned. Check out Practical Defense Systems. Those are the things I do to actually eat and pay my bills. And wherever you go and whatever you do. Be safe.